it's good to have us a turned on preacher. So <laughs> praise the Lord. It's been good to have Gordon to lead us this evening as he's done so well. And lovely to see all of you here because uh, we've had such a good attendance every night and we appreciate that very, very much. And uh, it's been lovely to hear different expressions of people that have been enjoying the good word of the Lord. We don't want to listen to a preacher or we want to learn what the word of God teaches us in these, the closing days of time. I think it was um, Stephen Alford, he said he was taking meetings on the same subject as us this week on Bible prophecy. And a dear lady went out one night, she says, oh, Mr. Alford, I'm really enjoying these pathetic meetings that you're conducting. Uh, she got a little bit mixed up. Well now, friends, what a lovely day we've had. I was up the town this morning. You have a great town here. Good shops, nice people, and lovely to see all the children on the streets. They're on half term, aren't they? And the special thing, I don't know what it was, but they sell apples and goodness knows what all over the streets. And it was great to be up there giving out the tracts and the uh, creation leaflets. My, it was very, very good. In England, I join a team often on a Saturday, um, about a dozen of us, sometimes a few more. And we do get a lot of abuse in the city of Lancaster, near where I live, and all the students are studying there. But it, this morning, it was marvelous. I didn't get any refusals, one or two did. But most of the dear people of your town were very respectful and uh, they thanked me, they all said thank you and they all took a leaflet, one dear little lady, uh, she says, what is it? Like that. I thought, oh, look out. And I says, well, this is the gospel of John, the way of salvation. And she said, I'm Catholic, but the world's in such a mess. God bless you, she said, and she took it and went on her way. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. She took the word, so that was the main thing. And what a lovely morning we had. As uh, I really enjoyed it up in, this, up in the square with Desi and the boys. If you know who the boys are, there's a few sisters as well. But we had a very good morning distributing the scriptures and uh, the gospel. So, uh, thank you for your prayers for that. Um, just one or two things to mention. Um, good DVDs and books on the bookstore. Please have a browse as you leave. On the left, and my newly found sales assistant, James. He's good. I could do with him coming to England and with me and coming around everywhere with me. He's good. He writes everything down. And uh, anybody that owes for the next night, he's got the names and addresses written down. <laughs> I says to him, James, don't worry. I'll find out where they live if they're not paid up. I'll find out. But James, he's a great boy, and uh, I've enjoyed having him to help. He's on the bookstore. Um, Dr. Stephen Borland, who pastored Valley Clare Baptist Church for many years, a very, very able expositor of the Scripture, and a young man, well, younger than me. Uh, he's uh, a, a, a great young man, and he's, uh, Dr. Stephen Borland gave at the Prophetic Witness Conference in Bournemouth this year seven messages Yes, that's right. Each evening he spoke on Thy Kingdom Come, a seven-part study, and you can get all those very, very detailed and important exposition, expositions of the thousand-year reign of Israel's Messiah, the millennium. I'm sure that you know that in the Greek New Testament, it isn't a thousand years, but the thousand years. And it's a very special a designated period of coming world history when the Lord Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron, says the book of the Revelation, where we're going to be shortly this evening. So if you can get those, I'm sorry, as I said the other night, I'd like to be Father Christmas and give you one, but they're 11 pounds something, and James will serve you. If you can get that, you've uh, DVDs, not CDs, DVDs, seven of them, and you'll have a whole Bible course on the coming kingdom and messianic reign of Israel's king, Yeshua HaMashiach. And then uh, also on the bookstall is the book I mentioned the other night. I wrote a foreword for it for Dr. Dom Donald Cameron. He's an academic and a ling linguist. He speaks fluent Russian. 
and was employed by the British government in the last war as a linguist. And he worked in Islamic countries and he's got some very deep spiritual insights into the world of Islam and he's written a book, Israel, the Church and Islam. That's a very, very good book, hot off the press from John Ritchie in Scotland. So have a look uh, when you leave on the left hand side. And last of all, <laughs> brothers and sisters, we'll get the notices out the way in a minute. Um, some of you know that I go to Romania at least once every year. I always go in January um, for a week. And I go to the Bible school, which is in Sibiu, right in central Romania, and open brethren, the dear, lovely believers who gather there, the young men who head up the work. They're pastors, youth leaders, and so on. Over a hundred of them are already booked for January. And along with Eric Scott and another brother, I go every January and we have an in-depth Bible school which we hold at the, the Golgotha Bible School in central Romania. Last year I spoke through the book of Genesis on seeing Christ in Genesis. And I called it foreshadowings of Christ in Genesis, right from the first verse of Scripture, Genesis 1-1, Christ is there. He's in, every, he's in all the Scriptures. And this year I'm going to do, God willing, I'm going to do Christ in Exodus. They were so blessed and thrilled, it was very humbling to learn this, that they're going to print my lectures my, to the Bible school, in Romanian of course, for the church, churches and the assemblies in Romania. Will you pray for us? Now, if you will pray for me, I would be so grateful. I will send you two little prayer letters. They go out about the first week in December. And there's one which is my general ministry letter. And this is what we call, what I call Balkan Vision. There is a team of us, a small team of godly brothers uh, who run this, but I founded this charity. It's a UK-based charity and we operate in Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Ro um, uh, yes, Moldova, that's what I was trying to get hold of, and in Ukraine. Uh, if you would like to receive that, I send it out free, and I'd be only too delighted. But you'll need to put your name and address and your postcode there. And James, he, he overlooks all this, and he'll see that you put your names and your postcode in the right place. Be only too delighted to think that you were remembering the work in prayer, remembering me in your prayers been a great joy through the years to have so many dear praying friends and now my dear wife is home with the Lord I lead a bit of a lonely life um, but when I get home I've always got a lot of writing to do and preparation to do so that keeps me busy and uh, I'm so thankful for the loving thoughts and prayers of God's people thanks for your loving welcome this week you've all been so warm and kind in your welcome the Northern Ireland people are always like that and the longer I stay over here, the more I get to like you. So I'm telling you now straight, and it's really good to be with you. And thank you for your fellowship and your lovely, lovely welcome. I've always had that here in Northern Ireland. And I'm thankful again for your will welcome here. Well, let's turn to the Word of God together because that's why we've come this evening. And I want us to read, first of all, from the second epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and commencing to read at verse 1. When we've read selected verses from this chapter, a very dramatic chapter concerning the future of planet Earth, the future of a world without God, the future of a world that elects to live, wants to live without God, We'll read from 2 Thessalonians 2, and then we're going to jump to the book of the Revelation. You won't be surprised. I announced last night we're going to be looking at chapter 13, a very dramatic chapter uh, concerning the coming world Antichrist and how we may escape the coming wrath of Jesus Christ, the wrath of the Lamb mentioned in the Apocalypse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, that is, he's referring to some special revelation, or by word, that is, by a false report, nor by letter, as from us. There were those trying to deceive the church, 
Thessalonica by having letters supposedly written by Paul, but written by false teachers. And what was the deception? As that the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Just put your finger, if you will, brothers and sisters, under that word perdition there. Can you see in that verse something very plain in the teaching of the apostle, that the day of the Lord will not come without the revealing of the man of sin. We shall see his titles in a moment. Before Jesus Christ, Antichrist. Before the true Christ, a false Christ must come. It's in the plan and purpose of God to test and to bring the world to judgment. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, and we note the capital G, the, the blasphemous claims to deity, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, a kind of a secret, hidden, occultic plan of Satan. Only he who now letteth or hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked, and we note the capital W, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Well, that's good news. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs and lying wonders. He's going to deceive the whole world and they will worship him. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. But in the Greek New Testament, there's a, a noun in there. They, they should believe the lie. He is Satan's big lie, the coming world man of sin, or the wicked one, as he's called here in his numerous titles. Verse 12, friends, that they all might be damned or condemned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So through to Revelation chapter 13, and we'll read all of this very dramatic uh, 13th chapter. It's even has uh, an ominous number in the book of the Revelation, chapter 13. For 13 in Scripture is the number of human rebellion. Revelation chapter 13, and we're at verse 1. John writes, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, who turns out to be Satan himself, later in the, in the apocalypse, gave him, the beast, his power, his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And we say, as we read that word, word verse carefully, that because of that, the, the world wondered after the beast. Just put your hand on the end of that verse, if you wish, and look up a second. The coming world antichrist will suffer some kind of an assassination attempt. It's not actually described to us, but he will have some kind of a death, resurrection. Maybe that will help the satanic lie that this man is God's Christ, like Jesus Christ. He will, be, he will be killed and resurrected. And they worship, verse 4, the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things, blasphemies, 
And power was given unto him to continue 42 months, three and a half years. The second half of the great tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. We mentioned it the other night. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed me against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, that is the tribulation saints, clearly identified in chapter 7, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. What an awesome personage. And all that dwell upon the earth, this is terrible too, shall worship him. They won't just respect him or obey him, but will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes or induces the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he, the false prophet, doeth great wonders, the second beast, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live, a deadly wound that he would, be, that he would recover from. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the beast, worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, friends, I want you to follow carefully at the close, the closing verses of this gruesome chapter. And he, the coming world ruler, the, the beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Why will he do that? Well, it's explained so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. He came up out of the sea of mankind. The word sea in verse 1 is not the ocean. That's a different word, thalassa. But in the Greek New Testament, it refers to the sea, the troubled sea of mankind. He's just a man. And here his number is the number of a man. But he's a man indwelt with occultic force and satanic energy. It's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. That's six, six, six. And I don't know how many books I've got, and some I haven't got any more that I've read proving it to be different people, um, Hitler, and Mussolini, and Stalin, Mr. Kissinger, Mrs. Thatcher, <laughs> the number of a man. <laughs> uh, some of this is all shaky. Friends, let me tell you what I think about this verse. You see, we're part of an emerging picture. But I think that from these last two verses in uh, Revelation 13, we can bring this deduction that when human history reaches this point, and I've been submitting to you night after night that we shall be gone, we'll be out of here. We shall not see these things. It's important that we know the prophetic future, but we shall be taken in the rapture to meet the Lord first. And that will start this great program of the end off, the countdown period, the great tribulation. I think that I've come to the conclusion that when the world gets there, they will be able to compute by computerology, they'll be able to compute the identity of this man. And the Jewish people, masters of computer, the intel, 
in your computer is from Israel, they'll be able to work out that this man is not God's Christ, but the false Christ. Of course, when the Jewish people see him perform 2 Thessalonians 2, the abomination of desolation, and set himself up as deity in that rebuilt Jewish temple we thought about, was it on Monday? They will know then that they haven't given their allegiance to God's Christ, but the devil's Christ. And when that happens, the abomination of desolation, I explained to you the desolator, there's a, um, a designation in there, they will know. And, and the Lord says to them, when that happens, you run, and he will be after you. Well, we thank God for his precious word. Brothers and sisters, the word of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, teaches us that in the future, human history is going to play into the hands of a global control freak. He's called the man of sin. We're going to look at his titles in just a moment. It won't take us long. In 2 Thessalonians 2. But that coming world super politician, a kind of final Fuhrer, will be satanic in his megalomanic desire to control the world in his hatred of the chosen people, the Jews, and of course in his great plan to seek to oppose and fight the righteous rule of Jesus Christ. And the Bible teaches us that that man will come. And the Old Testament and the New Testament too reveals to us that this counterfeit Christ he lurks in the wings of Bible prophecy, a Maline figure. You will find him in the book of Daniel. You'll find him in a, in a lot of other books of the scriptures. And we have been reading about him in the book of the Revelation, chapter 13. This raises the question for us, could this man uh, be alive today? If you look in the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verse 43, the Gospel of John, please, in your Bibles, chapter 5 and verse 43. John chapter 5, friends. Take your time. Verse 43. You see how the Lord Jesus himself warned about this coming imposter, the man of sin, coming world antichrist. He's going to rule the world. See what the Lord Jesus says about him in verse 43. I am come, Israel's Messiah, in my Father's name, and ye, ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Now friends, do you see there in the, in the tabernacle tonight an ominous prediction given by the Savior himself, that the world that would reject him, and he's addressing the Jewish people here, that would reject him by virtue of their rejection of him, would receive another. I have come in my own, I have come in my Father's name. You do not receive me. Another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. What a sad fact in prophecy of the future of our world that God loves and Christ shed his blood to save every lost sinner in the world. But the sad truth is the world continues to live in rebellion. We're a part of a, a rebel planet. And the world that elects to reject God's Christ by virtue of that will receive another Christ that's in the verse that we have read. So this raises for us tonight, dear friends, here in the, the tabernacle. Could this man be alive today? People ask me this. Could this man be alive today, breathing the same sort of air that we're breathing? He's a, he's a human being born somewhere in the world. In 1 John 2 and verse 18, let's look this up. John in his epistle, he has something to say about this. 1 John chapter 2, and we're at verse 18. Lovely to hear all the pages going over night by night. That's 
really encouraging for a Bible teacher. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, here he is, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby ye know it is the last time. But some of you will know that a careful study of the Greek New Testament, indeed it can be a cursory study of the Greek New Testament, some of you will know that the, you, he's writing, you will know the Antichrist will come. It's a capital A in some of your translations. You know that the big Antichrist is coming. Even now, there are many little Antichrists, a small A. Some of you will have that in your translation. The big one is coming. But there will be many prototypes, many ones, little ones that will come. And history is covered, I've mentioned it already, with these little Antichrists. They are all the same. They want to rule the world. They want to control the world. They hate the Jewish people, and they hate the God of the Jewish Scriptures. And so there are many that would come. And this too makes us think of the forerunners, maybe of the Antichrist. Maybe Satan, friends, I don't know what you think about this. Maybe Satan has always had a little Antichrist who would take the role of the big Antichrist. Maybe Satan's always had a man lurking in the side of the stage. Satan, you see, doesn't know when the rapture will take place. He doesn't know any more than we do the date when the Lord Jesus will come. Perhaps he's already, perhaps he's always had a man waiting in the wings to step out onto the stage and assume control of the media and the governments of the world. He's always had a man ready. Perhaps that's, that's what it means. There are many, even now, there are many antichrists. Satan doesn't know when the Lord will come. And then, as we think about this, is he already here? Just as the Lord Jesus was in the world, 30 years, awaiting for the time when he would be revealed to Israel. Hidden, his family knew, a few others knew, but following his baptism in Jordan, he stepped out to his glorious and divine rule, his three years of ministry and miracles. But there were silent years. Could it be that the beast has been born somewhere? And he's just waiting the day when he will have his time and he will step out upon the world scene. One thing we can be sure of, the world right now, we shall see this in a moment, is being prepared for this man to come, especially in global governance, global monetary supply, globalism, and the insoluble global problems that the world is reminded constantly that it is facing. How wonderful, brothers and sisters, that there is Jesus Christ. We're not looking for Antichrist, neither are we expecting him in that sense as believers. Christ, the man of sorrows. Antichrist is called the man of sin. Jesus Christ is called the perfect one. Antichrist is called the lawless one. Jesus is the king of kings. Antichrist is called the willful king. We might look at that in a moment. Christ is called the lamb. Lovely to see it up here tonight. Antichrist is called the beast. So we're studying Satan's big lie. We saw it, 2 Thessalonians 2, a counterfeit Christ who will have a religious counterpart, the false beast, and Satan himself, the dragon, who will infuse into him occultic and satanic intelligence that will give him power to hold the allegiance of all the peoples of the world. And friends, I don't like saying this, the world that wants to live without Jesus Christ will love the devil's Christ and will receive him. That's what the Bible says. And they will receive him and the world will worship him. Let's note some of his gruesome and awful titles in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. We saw it and read some of it. And we'll just go back. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and please we are down at verse 2. 
2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that is, a, a, a letter not from him at all, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, except there come the falling away first. And I want you to follow, friends, the man of sin be revealed. Notice that first mentioned title as the inspired apostle wrote of the prophetic future of planet earth. This man is called in scripture the man of sin. Hey, no wonder he hates this book. No wonder he hates the people who follow this book. This is the book that labels him, and libels him, the world will love him, but God says he will be the man of sin. He will be the ultimate transgressor and will lead by a hidden global agenda the politics of sin. And he will be against every holy law of God given for the protection of human life and behavior. Now I'm not going to go into this just here because I mentioned it on Sunday night. There is a particular sin that will define the last days. I want you to listen. These again are things I don't like speaking about. But there is a particular sin, a particular lifestyle that will define the last days. That sin is the last step before judgment. And I just mentioned it lies a sin in the realm of human sexuality. Very interesting that this man is called the man of sin. Maybe he will be, he will revel in that sin. Maybe he will love that sin. Now, we haven't time to go into this, but in the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel says that the coming world antichrist will not have the love of woman. You can look it up. I asked Arnold Fruchtenbaum, perhaps the best Hebrew scholar in the world, what a teacher he is. He said, the Hebrew is uncharacteristically unclear, but it could indicate that he will be the man of sin in that end time sense. We cannot be dogmatic, but certainly he's called here the man of sin. And then he's called in that same verse, the son of perdition. The son of perdition, suggesting that maybe the coming world antichrist will have a kind of a two natures, like God's Christ, a man, and yet he's a son of hell, of perdition. The Lord Jesus Christ was truly human, and yet truly divine. He wasn't half human, half divine. It's a mystery, incarnation, God made man. Great is the mystery of godliness, writes Paul. God was manifest in the flesh. What was it? That at the same time he was, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ was 100% God, divine, and yet at the same time he was 100% human. Maybe the beast will be like that. We don't know. But it calls him here the son of perdition. In verse 8, he's called the lawless one. Every godly law that God laid out from the Garden of Eden, he will be against. Friends, are you listening to the message this evening? Do you know that in my country, in our country, in the United Kingdom, it seems to me that everything that God ordained from Eden's garden, my government and my media and the education system are going against. They don't like the law of God. No one God to tell them how to live. We will live our own lives. That idea. And here he is called the lawless one. A world of men and women being prepared mentally to receive a man they will love because he just says you can do as you like. There is no God. And there we go. That's what he will be. He's called the lawless one. And I want you to turn please to um, the book of Daniel. I said we would and we're in chapter 8 and at verse 23. The Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 8. Again, I do encourage you and love to see the Bibles turning over. Book of Daniel, chapter 8. Daniel is the apocalypse of the Old Testament. The book of the Revelation of the Old Testament. And he lays out for us so many things about the last days. And he speaks of the Antichrist. 
Uh, will the, uh, Daniel chapter 8, and we're at verse 23. Now in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, what an awful expression, the cup of man's rebellion will come to the full. A king, this is not God's king, the Lord Jesus, but the devil's king, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. He will come to prominence. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. We read in Revelation 13, the dragon gives him his power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper. Good times will come economically and world trade in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. We looked at this the other night. And by peace he will destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, as God will be the Lord Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without hand. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we read that he will be destroyed by the brightness of the coming of the Son of Man. Here we are taught that the coming control freak will be full of his own importance. He will exalt himself, the people will love him, and how interesting that this man uh, the very devil incarnate, a man indwelt with occultic power, will be so received and so loved. But this is how we go. Will you turn back how the, the future will be? Will you turn please to Revelation 13 again? Lovely to see you listening so well. God bless you. It's been a lovely week and we're enjoying it. And I know that you are too. Revelation 13 and down the chapter please. To the end. Verse 16. And he causeth all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, it means every global citizen, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What's that for? It's, it says here, so that or and that, in order that, no man, no citizen in the world at that time will, may buy or sell, except he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then we did read, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding. And we got to the place where we saw that this perhaps, we, the people of the world will not know until the world gets there. They will be able to compute his identity from computerology. His name is a numbered name, 666. But I want to draw your attention to verse 17, that the mark of the beast, the purpose of it, is to number, classify, index every citizen of the world. What is the purpose of that global numbering of the world's population? I think it's right here in the verse. It's to do with money. It's to do with global payment and money and finance. They will have to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead so that no one will be able to buy or sell. That gives us a clue what this is about. Maybe the coming world antichrist, we cannot imagine such a thing happening as one man controlling the people of the world. But what if a great global crash in the world's financial system, a global money collapse, and money was worth nothing. Now then, let's think about that. You know that our politicians, without any word or vote from us, have been working hard, recent governments over the last 40 years have been working to stitch together and build together a global financial system. A system in which no individual country will have autonomy or independence or its own uh, money system, but a world that is independent and put together like this. And no one country 
will have its own control over its finances. Brothers and sisters, we could spend a night here. I could give you many, many facts, but this is it. They call it the global economy. The one world money system. It's man's attempt to build human base security. But it will not, it will fail. And what if there came a great financial crash and uh, the shops were closed, sold out, nothing could happen. Would the world welcome a man like the beast? A super politician that all the nations of the world and the people of the world, they liked him and they worshipped him. And he's the big fixer. He can even bring peace to the Middle East. Here is a great controller and a great operator, a shrewd operator. And by stealth, he will trick the world into accepting the new world, the global order. And they will take the mark of the beast in the right hand or in the forehead. Without the mark of the beast, they won't be able to buy or sell. We conjecture the necessary uh, commodities of life at the supermarket, the bread and the milk and all the eggs and all the things. You know, that people won't be able to buy unless they have the mark of the beast or, or, or the number of his name. Dear brothers and sisters here in the tabernacle tonight, you know, here are Bible verses I've heard ridiculed as a young man in particular and still. Here are passages of scripture that the liberals in the church said, how could anybody possibly believe the Bible literally to be true? Who could believe this, that there could be a system of government that control, could control spending and finance and transactions? This is beyond belief. Nobody, they, they laughed at the Bible. But they don't laugh at the Bible tonight now. Because the miracle of miracle of microchip technology has made it possible for the first time in human history that the mark can be placed on the human anatomy. I'll tell you in a second, there are world governments that are already, are already doing it. Friends, listen. Technology and science has moved the world on. Nobody laughs at the Bible anymore or the thought of someone who could classify, index, and bring in a numbered society. How ridiculous, it was totally incredible, but they don't laugh at it anymore because technology and science has moved the world on. For the first time in human history, the Bible can be fulfilled. Of course, for the first time in the last 2,000 years, the rebirth of the nation of Israel, God's super sign, the Lord Jesus couldn't come before 1948, but so many things are moving on. We're living in exciting times. Let me say this to you carefully. Because the world has moved on, because technology and science has moved the world on in the context of what we're studying at the end of Revelation 13, because of that, we, this might be, we, we could be the first generation that will be the last generation that will see the return of Christ. And may I say that again? Because of what is happening, we could be the first generation in all of human history that could be the last generation. The last generation that will witness the world return of the, right, the world's rightful ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are moving on. Now what about this mark of the beast? Well, now, I've done a little bit of study here, as some of you have done, and some of you are talking about it today, the mark of the beast. Already in uh, penal institutions in Australia and Canada, they Im put into the human anatomy, I think, not particularly on the hand, but on the forearm here. And some places on the forehead, and it, this happens in America too, in the prisons, the penal institutions, um, they put... Uh, sterile plastic, it's injected under the skin, here on the forearm somewhere. Having put that invisibly, just a little pinprick that heals up, onto that plastic disc and a rough disc underneath the human skin, they can put the barcode with a laser. And what happens is that very easily, the boys go in and out of prison, they've got a day off or something like that, they just hold their hand like this or their forearm, 
to the computer screen like in a supermarket it goes ping and up will come their identity their religion when they were born how many days more how many years more they've got yes quick identity the mark of the beast the world is moving on and did you dear friends know that every time you pay on a card as I pay for petrol fill up the car or put some petrol in and you have what they call an electronic transaction pay with cash that's okay but if you pay on the card and we all do it's a modern thing and we are, it's, it's very easy just put your pin in um, and put your pin number and then you pay you don't need cash we're headed for a cashless society cash will be out it's clumsy it's old it could be stolen it's inconvenient pay on the card uh, ju just a minute did you know that once you pay on the card at the supermarket or the petrol station did you know that if a government wish they can trace that electronic payment they will know where you were who you were what time you were there and the place where you made that payment now of course we're not as scared of that that's got holes, not much fear for us because uh, we have a democratically sort of democratically elected government we're not a stronger democracy as we used to be but friends here is a system of information and surveillance that people like Hitler Mussolini Joseph Stalin, they only dreamed about this. Here they have instant access to every citizen that ever pays an electronic payment. And I, I was lecturing in Cape and Ray some years ago, and I go next month, maybe you'll remember me in prayer, and I'll send out some pictures with that um, prayer letter that I'll send out. Let me have you, kindly your name and address here. I go to Cape and Ray next month. 200 young people will be there, 100 in Romania, 200 in Cape and Ray. Half of them come from America and Canada, and the rest are from all over the world, different places. One year, and I take them through the doctrine of the last things, eschatology, the doctrine of, of the return of Christ. And they love it. They really love to hear it every year. We always have a happy time. I, I used to play football with them and swim, but I don't do that anymore. I remember the year that I dealt with Revelation 13 and a lovely Christian girl sitting down there on the side of the lecture hall. The longer I went on about the mark of the beast, her eyes were opening wide, a lovely Christian girl. The end of the lecture, she hurried up to the platform. She says, Mr. Parsma, can I talk to you? Yeah, of course you can. They all come to ask questions. She said, I want to tell you something. My, I am Canadian and for the last 10 years, she's only in her 20s, I have been working for the Royal Bank of Canada, but I am under an oath of secrecy. I am a free citizen. I can marry if I wish, have children if I wish, but I'm under a lifelong oath of secrecy to the government and the bank, Royal Bank of Canada. There are certain secrets that I embraced and I was confidential things in the banking world that if I let out, I can be put into prison. I'm under an oath of secrecy for my life. And I signed that and I agreed to it. And she said, what you have been teaching this morning for me is absolutely astonishing. All I will tell you is this, that in the top echelons of the banking managers of the planet, in Moscow, New York, London, Strasbourg, what you've preached to us about this morning, I have heard discussed. Boys, I tell you, that stopped my heart and made me understand these things are going to happen. The Word of God will be fulfilled. And you see the credit card. A guy can jump on you, and get a gun, put it to your head. Your pin number, please. If you want to value your life, you give it to him. It can be stolen. Money can be stolen. But if the secret is encrypted on the human anatomy, they can't steal it or do anything about it. Friends, the Bible says the mark of the beast will come. No date is given. 
He will be deeply religious. He will have a death and resurrection. He will deceive the whole world. But thank the Lord, his doom is sealed. And he will be defeated. And I want you just to turn to one or two closing scriptures. 2 Thessalonians 2 again. We've already been there. Uh, we're doing well for time. And I hope you're interested in our subject this evening. <clears throat> Tomorrow we'll think about something different. And we'll think about the judgment seat of Christ for the Christians. It's a very challenging but blessed doctrine in the scriptures. I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, please. 2 Thessalonians 2, but Dan, we've read it, but we'll go back to it. And then, when is then? Well, verse 7, if you want to look at that, brothers and sisters, the mystery of iniquity, the secret occultic hidden plan of the devil for the, people's wor for the world of people doth already work. It was working in Paul's time, working in the Old Testament, working in Babylon. Only he who now hinders will hinder, let, until he be taken out of the way. What is hindering this Antichrist coming out? Is he already born? Is he lurking in the wings? Is he just waiting to assume control and stand on the world stage and act out his God-given but satanic, God-allowed but satanic uh, drama. I, is he about to do that? Something is holding him back. There's a restrainer. Something holding him back. And most lovers of Scripture and I go along. My teaching is that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. We don't think of the restrainer, the Holy Spirit is a restrainer. He's a life giver, an, illumina an illuminator, and above all, a Christ glorifier. He shall glorify me, the one who has sealed us Christ's for the day of redemption. The beautiful, manifold ministries of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit in the world is holding back the plan of Satan. When the church goes, it seems the Holy Spirit with the church. He indwells the church. We will be taken too. And yet the Holy Spirit will still work in the arena of human lives and concerns. For in the tribulation, John saw a multitude that no man could number coming out of the tribulation that were saved and, and the tribulation saints. But the work of the Holy Spirit hindering Satan will happen, I submit to you, and there may be other views, as the church is taken and with us, the person of the Holy Spirit will go. Now, I'm sure that you know that what this world would really like and what people in, some of the people, I must be careful, in our government would like is a world without God, a world without the Bible, a world without God's holy laws, a world without the Christians. They don't like us. Uh, we're, we irritate them and annoy them, and they call us fundamentalists and all sorts of things. They don't really like us, and they would like us to be gone so that they can have the world as they want it. And when we've put God out and the Bible out and the Christians, they don't really like us at all, then the world will be a wonderful place. Let me tell you, friends, that that's what they'll get one day. We will be gone. And the Holy Spirit's restraining influence will be gone. Thank God his word will still be here. But the church of Jesus Christ will be raptured, delivered from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. Even Jesus who raises from the dead and who delivers us from the wrath to come. And friends, they will think it will be heaven on earth. It will be hell on earth. When God begins to judge the mark of the beast. I have one or two little scriptures for you in closing. And I want you to turn, please, in your Bible uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. Because I want to end up on a practical note. 2 Corinthians 5, 11. You see, when Bible prophecy and God's tremendous future... Tremendous future for the church, not, 
not for the world, it's a future of judgment, but God's tremendous future for his people. When it is proclaimed sometimes, the thought comes to us, why do we need to study this? Why is Mr. Passmore tonight talking about Revelation 13? If we're not going to be here, if we're going to be gone, if we're going to be out of here, what is the purpose of, of us studying prophecy regarding the future of the world, the planet without God? Well, here I submit to you is a very sound answer to that inquiry. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Go back to the beginning of the verse. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. When is the terror of the Lord? This is not the time of the terror of the Lord. This is the time of the grace of the Lord. Men mock God and laugh at God, but the terror doesn't come. But the terror of the Lord will come in that time when the church, I believe, is gone and when the great tribulation, as Christ called it, I think I mentioned to you the other night, it has ten Bible names. It's called the day of the Lord. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. There are ten different names for it, but the most well-known one is given in Matthew 24 by our Savior himself. He called it the great tribulation. And I don't know if I explained to you, there are definite articles in there. It's literally tribulation, the great one, a capital T, G and a capital T, tribulation, the great one. It's a special period of trouble for the world, unprecedented. And the Lord Jesus said, except those days be shortened, there would no flesh be saved. But by war and famine and killing and death, the book of the Revelation, there would no flesh be saved, but for the, for the elect's sake, that period shall be shortened in mercy. Knowing therefore, writes Paul here in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Bible prophecy is to sharpen our witness, to tell a world headed for judgment, turn to Jesus Christ, escape the wrath to come, that's what the scripture says. Join the church of Christ. Be born again. Make sure you're saved. and Redeemed by the blood of Christ. So that when the Lord comes to the air for his own, you'll be one of the taken. You'll be caught away to meet the Lord. And you'll escape this wrath. How wonderful that Paul writes. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. He's thinking about up ahead. The day of the Lord. The great tribulation. The numbered society, we persuade men. We tell them the gospel. We tell them the gospel of redeeming grace and redeeming love and the theme of God's wonderful salvation. I want to say something to you very carefully, friends. You've been so kind in your attention tonight. Something uh, very important. Bible prophecy is not merely for information listening to my little message this evening, you might think that's what it is. It's just Bible teaching is information. Let me assert this. Bible prophecy is not merely for information. It is for transformation. It's to change us. Peter writes, he that hath this hope in him, that is, he who looks forward to the coming of the Lord, he that hath this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. The second advent is a purifying hope. What a wonderful thing to know that the Lord could come. We're thinking here of believers, not of the world that's lost and getting ready for the Antichrist, but the world of the Christian, the world of the believer. How wonderful to know that this is to purify me, to sharpen my witness, to make me a deeper, better Christian and to deepen my walk day by day with the Lord. As I taught you, was it on Tuesday, the imminency, the Bible, New Testament doctrine of imminence. We say, perhaps today. That's it. Perhaps today. We know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. And I think I told you, Augustine said, that day lies hid, that every day 
we'd be on the watch. Did you get it? He hasn't disclosed the date. So that every day we say, perhaps today, the Savior, the Lord, will come. Now I've finished, but perhaps you'll let me finish like this. The little girl in England, her mummy said to her, there's no school today, and your daddy's at work, but I've got to go to the supermarket. Now you be a good girl and, and stay here. I, I'll be coming back, and you know you're not allowed to go in the cupboard where the food is, and you're not allowed to go in these drawers. And she told her different things. Oh, yes. But mummy was a long way, long time, sorry, at the supermarket. Um, I don't know who she got talking to up there. That's what happens often. Long, long time at the supermarket. And the little girl, she got fed up waiting for her mummy. And she got doing what she shouldn't do. Went in the cupboard and got out the jam and the golden syrup and the sweets and the cookies, the biscuits and so on. And suddenly, the door opened and her mother returned. At that moment, her mother came through the door. What would we say? Did she love her mummy still? Yes. She loved her mother, but she didn't love her mother's appearing at that moment. And the Bible has a special word in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that there will be a reward for all those who love Jesus Christ, yes, but all those who love his appearing. A crown laid up for Christians who love the truth that Jesus Christ may come today. If I asked of the congregation in closing, I'm not going to, but if I asked how many would stand who can say, Brother Alec, I love Jesus Christ. I hope you'd all stand. How many would stand if I were to say, and I'm not asking this, but if I, how many would stand if I were to say, how many of you can stand and say, I love his appearing? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is coming, and we have to live a life of daily readiness. Thank you for listening. Our closing hymn.